How did you get started? Wow, how, my, how long do you have? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I got started, uh, let's see, 1975, 1976. So I had played with pickups before since I was a teenager. Originally, I wanted to do microphones, but the cost of getting into doing microphones and sort of general capital costs and engineering and all that were a little, a little much for me. And, it, and I had played with pickups before. I was like, oh, okay, hey, this is really good. Well, I mean, it was a, a somewhat of a foregone conclusion that, I mean, in my mind anyway, that the pickup itself was ripe for improvement. Passive pickups themselves are, they're very limited in their sort of capabilities. Their resonance curves are sort of predetermined and, and there isn't a whole lot that you can do with them. And they're noisy. You know, there were a lot of aspects of it that I just really thought, you know, I could do something with. The first design that I did was, uh, we tore apart my brother's guitar. It was a 335, beautiful guitar. It's probably worth $25,000 now. <laughs> Untouched, it would be worth that much. And well, we took the pickups out of it rewound them, put a preamp on it, put the guitar back together, and it sounded so much different than it did before. It's kind of like a muse having a, a different pickup in your guitar. If it functions, if it works well, you can typically do something with it. And, and it, it tends to sort of bring you, you know, bring new ideas to the, to the table. You play differently, it feels different. So that, that was sort of the original one. It didn't really do all the things that an EMG can do these days, but it did give me an idea of, oh, hey, this, there's a lot to play with here. And I think that was the most intriguing thing. It's like, oh, well, you know, making a business of this may be fruitless, but playing around with it and having a good time was really more fun than, you know, than, oh, I need to make a living. Once I hit sort of pay dirt, I mean, there was a day when I built a pickup and I, I was trying this and trying the thing out and I turned up the amp and, and the, the pickup was sitting on a bench and, and it didn't make any noise. It, it was like it wasn't buzzing, it wasn't humming, it, nothing was happening. I was going, well, it's not working. And I went over and I hit it with a screwdriver and it was just like, whoa, this thing is, this thing's functioning. And I turned the amp up and it was just like, it's, this thing is, it's noiseless. It's not... I wonder what this thing sounds like, you know? And then it was sort of, that's when I moved on. And then I thought, well, you know, I've got a, I've actually got a product here. I've got something I can, I can sell. I can introduce to people. It's got benefits, it's got features, it's got, you know, all of these things. And yeah, there was a bit of feedback about, well, it needs a battery. I was like, well, you know, don't worry about that part right now. And then I went to, um, I went to a NAMM show. My brother Bill and I, he got involved in the business um, a couple of years after I started it and, you know, because I needed an employee more or less and he wanted a job and so it worked out really well. Introduced the product. We got a couple of distributors, one in Canada, Art White Music. He was sort of our, our first big customer. Found some, a couple of sales reps to, to sell product. It was small. There were the two of us working in a bedroom. It was, it was fun. We had a great time. And then the next year, you know, we gathered a little traction and, and hired, I think we had four or five, six employees in a little, in a little building out on the back on Village Side Avenue in Santa Rosa. People got the gist that it was a good product and, and sort of off we went. We just started, it just started happening. The first models were Stratocaster pickups because they were the ones that were, I mean, they were simple, they were single coil. You know, I tried ceramic magnets, I tried all kinds of different windings, different stuff. They all buzzed and that sort of was my, you know, that was the part that I just really hated. And here I'm building a pickup, I'm trying to hear what it sounds like and it's going, you know, and I'm like, okay, this, is, this has got to stop. Then it was like, oh, I need two coils. 
Then I need two coils that are not sitting right next to one another. I need two coils that are separate from one another so that they don't interact with one another. And so that's, that sort of brought on humbucking. You know, I need a bigger platform. Instead of a single coil pickup, I need a, I need a bigger platform. Basically, it just gave me a bigger easel is all it did. Returning to single coils, I mean, eventually they became a stack design. We had side-by-sides for a long time. The SAs were actually side-by-sides for, for many years. And then we went to a stacked format. The 81 is actually from 1981. The 85, it's a pickup that was designed early on. In fact, it, it sort of dates back to the early Stratocaster pickups. I know it's a dual coil pickup, but the design actually sort of goes back to the early Stratocaster pickups. But we ended up building a model called the 58, which was just a, a steel mongrel. I mean, it was, um, it's just a big, fat sounding pickup. And so the 58 and the 81 were actually the, the sort of early models 81 used a ceramic magnet and the, and the 58 used an Alnico. That was really the only difference between the two of them. But the 85 was like, we needed to get rid of the 58 because you couldn't get the noise out of it. It's a great sounding pickup. I mean, it has its attributes, but the 85 is, is just simply, a, it's a better match for the 81, especially in the fingerboard position. It has a, a tone to it or a, a resonance to it that's they're somewhat similar, but they are definitely, 81 and 85 are two different paintbrushes, no doubt. The 89 is uh, uh, the first sort of switchable, although we did make a pickup in the very early days called the DM, which had three coils that sat next to each other, and you would choose between a single or two of them. And the original design for the 89 was the DM. The 89 is nothing more than a redesign of the, the DM pickup. The biggest issue becomes you're going to be installing these in a guitar and you want to make it as simple and easy as you can. We always supplied um, controls with a guitar, mainly because you needed them. They were 25K as opposed to 250 or 500K. You know, we supplied controls, it, basically everything that you needed in order to be able to put it in your guitar. Well, when we got started, um, I mean, we were making uh, bobbins by hand. We were cutting up business cards and super gluing them to magnets and wrapping them with tape and winding the coils. And so it got to the point where it was like, well, we need a bobbin. And, you know, when you're starting a business, injection molding a, a bobbin is not it's not, it wasn't a cheap process. But over a period of years, it got to the point to where we were creating, you know, we were developing enough money to be able to say, okay, hey, let's, let's, let's make some bobbins. Let's do this. And so I've always been sort of geared towards having it in-house because when you're in the pickup business, you need to make a variety of pickups. You can't just make a Stratocaster pickup and expect to sort of pay the mortgage with it. It's not gonna work. And so, humbucking, bass, all these different designs, they all became what you, in, in manufacturing, you would call short run. And there isn't any manufacturer that you could take them to and you would say, oh, well, can you make me 20 of these? They would look at you like, 20? How about 2,000? I'll make it 2,000. You'd be like, okay, no, that's not gonna work. And so you get stuck sort of having to make things yourself. So it, it grew into a point to where, well, if we're gonna do this, we gotta do it ourselves because nobody really wants to touch us. Luckily, we found some people who were really great people. John Carruthers. John is one of those guys who looks around and says, why are you paying somebody else to do that? You can do that yourself. You're not stupid, you know? And, and John was really very, um, he was like, well, you should just make that machine yourself. You're capable. And he was like, okay, well, just do this, just do this, just do this. And we're like, okay, great. Yeah, that's a good idea. We'll do that, you know. And I come from a family of, of do-it-yourselfers. You know, if you want it done right, do it yourself. That's my mom's sort of her mantra. So we ended up just sort of building a business where we just do everything. We needed to assemble circuit boards. We certainly weren't going to pay somebody to do that. I mean, I'd assembled enough circuit boards in my lifetime to 
you know, to say, well, okay, we need to do this automatically. Well, manufacturing in California is probably the stupidest thing in the world that you could do. But I mean, since I was born here, I mean, my dad was, was like, you don't want to be in manufacturing. Whatever you do, don't go into manufacturing. You want to be in distribution. And I was like, okay, great. So where did I end up? Manufacturing. But, you know, we were really lucky. When we started, my brother and I, we had some people who were very loyal to us. It was, it was amazing. And then we've had uh, production people, Ramon, Miguel, um, Sylvia, I mean, just all kinds of, of people who, Desai, who have been with us for 30, 35 years or more and are still with us. I mean, it's amazing. I don't know why they stay. They've got great pension plans. They should just retire and get the hell out. But So we've been really lucky there. And I mean, it's a great working environment, you know, and I'm a very easygoing boss. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't go out on the floor and yell at people and, and do all that sort of thing. So it's a really, it's a great environment to work in. I've heard so many comments about putting batteries in, in instruments. Like, oh, batteries belong in flashlights. And I never thought twice about putting a battery in an instrument. Everything's got a battery in it these days. Your telephone's got a battery in it. Your car's got a battery in it. Everything's got batteries in it. I mean, what's the big deal? I looked at it as much like uh, a microphone. A good microphone is typically active. It needs a battery. Um, they don't call them active microphones. I mean, there's a TS-1000 right here in front of me, and it's got a 9-volt battery in it. And batteries these days have improved dramatically, too. A 9-volt battery is a great battery. It packs a lot of energy. The amount of waste that you have at the end of its life is very limited compared to uh, rechargeable batteries. They're, you know, the chemistry is simpler. Solderless was not my decision, actually. I got an email from a guy. What happened was, we were making a lot of pickups. Daily, we make a lot of pickups. And they have to be tested. And it got to the point to where we were using, you know, alligator clips to put it on the wires in order to test them. When you're testing four or 500 pickups a day, you get repetitive motion problems. And so it was like, okay, we need to put a, a connector on the bottom of the pickup. We started putting a connector on the bottom of the pickup simply for for manufacturing ease and for testing ease. Then I got an email from a guy one day. I, I, if he ever sees this video, he, maybe he'll remember sending it to me. I've looked for it, I can't find it. But I got an email from a guy one day and he said, well, you know, you put a connector on the pickup, why not put connectors on everything else? And I was just like, bingo, babe, let's go. You know, this sounds good. And then it, it took a long time to sort of like, okay, how many different control setups are there? How many different guitars are there? There's volume, volume, tone. There's volume, tone, each volume, tone. We need a, we need a bus. We need, to, we need to be able to plug this stuff in to somewhere so that you can send it somewhere. And we need a power bus. And, and so a lot of that had to be thought out. You know, you want to be able to satisfy any guitar. And the controls that we still make actually have solder pads on them so if you want to solder to it you can but our industry is one that is caught up in history and it's sort of very difficult to get away with moving things on transistors don't sound like tubes fets don't sound like tubes nothing you know um, it has to be point to point because it has to have these style of components in it and you know old style components it's understandable i just don't cotton to it at all it's just not my, you know, it's not the way that I, I see things. I've just decided to move on. That's all. I decided to move on 45 years ago.